Today I'm joined by Helene Popkin. She has a master's degree in nutrition, which she used to support wellness and spirituality, not only for herself, but also for her clients. Stay tuned as she describes the undeniable connection between lifestyle practices that bring more light into our hearts, minds, bodies, and bellies. Click like, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you all so much. Um, looking at my acne in a much more holistic way, uh, as a whole body, you know, my, my blood, my gut, um, and then I started to really understand the skin and which herbs, you know, so I just really started to look outside Western medicine because the solutions they were providing me were not working. They were not effective for my acne. They were not effective for my irritable bowel syndrome. They were not effective for a number of things that, that were ailing me. It seems that you're quite accomplished. You've been running health programs for over 20 years. You're a world-class vegan chef. You've presented some of these methodologies on TV. You know several languages and you traveled most of the world. You're a, a Ford model. You're a, uh, now, so a top student in, you're going to have to help me with this, Indian practices of? Iyengar. Iyengar. Very yoga. cool. Okay, yeah. I've never heard of that. That's very neat. And I think I, out of all of that, I love this the most. So, you know, you kind of wrote this, I guess, the summary. Most notably, you're an awesome mom. Yeah. Yeah. So that just kind of resonated. I was like, she's pretty cool. I like her. No, yeah, <laughs> that's been the biggest gift and challenge, right? And she's on her way out. She's, she's, she says to me, this cake is baked. Just need some sprinkles and some decoration. But awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been the greatest, greatest gift to be a mother. That's great. So, You've had some pretty severe health challenges in the past. You've been faced with um, potential leg amputation. Um, and I guess traditional medicine, it really, it really wasn't doing the trick for you. Uh, actually, let me back up just a little bit. What, why are you on this path? What puts you on this path? Well, life put me on this path and the challenges that uh, I faced. And I had some very real awakenings, so to say, uh, as a young child. Um, in our family, we, we loved food, but food represented both a celebration and also pain and suffering. Uh, my mother was in and out of Food Addicts Anonymous and Weight Watchers, was constantly you know, in this struggle and dialogue around food um, and weight. And early on, I had just chronic ear infections, and then all of a sudden, uh, they thought actually I had leukemia because my white blood cell count was too high. And it took them about six months to figure out that uh, I had uh, a small um, spot on one of the many x-rays. I found myself at one point sitting in the, um, on the floor of a, of a room that was just filled with x-rays of my body and MRIs and scans. Wow. And they found one little spot and they thought, well, that's gotta be it. She's got leukemia. And we found that we found where it is. So it took a bone marrow biopsy, which at age seven is terrifying. I think at any age yeah. um, with those huge needles. And uh, they realized it thankfully wasn't leukemia. It was osteomyelitis. And in this country, we can treat that with antibiotics. So on the one side, Western medicine did save my leg. But on the other side, um, you know, it may have may have been the cause of its development because it's very, very uncommon to have osteomyelitis in, in, the, in this country. Very, it's very common in India and other countries, but not so much here. So the question is why, why did that and, and what is it exactly? Osteomyelitis is like an infection of my bone marrow. Okay. And that is just a very unusual thing to have at age seven. I would agree. Yeah, and so it was, it was shocking uh, early on um, for, for me to have that kind of health challenge. My, uh, another health challenge came up for my mom. She went blind and she recovered her vision with a macrobiotic diet. So I became very aware at a young age that being sick is no fun and that Western medicine may not have all the answers, uh, although it had some answers, right? It saved my leg. And so uh, I, I went on this journey that has really never ended. Even today, I'm still learning so, so much of uh, taking responsibility for my health 
wishing that I could have taught my mother the things that I have learned in the last uh, decade or two. She died at age 59 with obesity as one of her causes of death. And I- well, It's interesting that she had that challenge and yet she was able to, you said she um, corrected her vision, regained her vision. She did. Because of, because of I mean, how did, how did she do that? She, they couldn't help her because it's, she has a, a very rare genetic disorder that is maybe genetic. They actually don't know. It's called fundus flava maculata, also known as Stargardt's disease. It's like one in a million people have it, but it belongs inside of the category of degenerative macular disorders. Yes. So her macula was de degenerating. And so uh, she inevitably would have gone blind, but this was like in her forties and that it was way too early. Usually it happens in, in older age and there's no solution for it. So there's nothing they could do for her. And um, she said, well, what are my other options? And so she decided to explore macrobiotics, which was, I'd never heard of. It wasn't something our family practiced. It's the, the way I, I believe the traditional Chinese medicine heals through diet. And so it's brown rice and salmon and greens and seaweed and very different than the standard American diet. But she did that for three months and she regained her vision. And it was alarming. I mean, none and, of us expected it. I mean, that, that's, that's really fantastic. I, I'm a little surprised and really happy to hear that despite her challenging her challenges with her diet, she was able to, I guess, take a break from a regular diet. Mm -hmm. And then she ate the, you know, these things that are much better for her, mm. corrected her vision. And then did she go back on her, you know, she went back to old ways, Yes, yes but did. her vision remained, I guess, after that point. No, it, it slowly degenerated. I mean, she did, she was having major problems when she died, uh, you know, at, at 19 years later, but. But I guess the impression that it left you with was that diet makes a difference. Diet makes a difference. It does. And I, and it did. And it does. I mean, I, I can't even tell you at this point now, the, I can't even count how many people have completely changed their lives. And it's not only diabetes or heart disease um, or chronic pain. It's also mood disorders. It's of mm. course, weight, body image, energy. I have to say energy is probably the, the most important one. Um, but diet makes a huge, huge difference. And there's a lot of debate about this because they don't teach medical doctors about nutrition. It's actually not a part of our Western medical degree. So it's a, it's an area that we all have to get educated on. And take I think that's just so unusual. <laughs> so uh, my, uh, I, you know, no, no disrespect to my father. Um, he's a, an amazing man. Um, he is a retired doctor. He and the whole office of doctors you know, I might be exaggerating a little bit. Many of the doctors from his office, most days, um, my father, I think, went all days, but many of the doctors went most days to McDonald's. That was their lunch, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, he still eats that sort of way. It's, it's always Pepsi. He will not drink water. Um, and, yeah, he does. He doesn't take care of his body in that way. Now, my my father, he's he has, he's kind of an uh, anomaly because he's older and he remains in really good shape. So, but that being said, um, you know, you're exactly right. None of that is part of what traditional medicine, what what they teach in traditional medicine. Well, they don't teach it in traditional medicine, and it's really weird because that should be the first step. You feel bad. <laughs> You don't take a pill, you should probably eat differently or fine tune what you're eating. Mm, absolutely. I'm, I'm a firm believer of that. But I do want to talk about your father's uh, condition, right? His condition of just happily eating McDonald's and drinking Pepsi. And I know a few men. He doesn't, like, he doesn't actually eat McDonald's very often anymore. So okay. I've got to give him some slack. But yeah. uh, he's not a healthy eater by any means. <laughs> I do think there's this, this uh, emotional element of guilt that definitely plays an, a role. Like I could be eating kale all day, but if I'm feeling guilty about it, like, oh, I should be eating kale sprouts, not kale, then there is an impact there. And there is a whole field of psycho neuroimmunology that is showing that thoughts and feelings impact our health. And uh, the men that I know who have lived a very unhealthy lifestyle with the alcohol and the fried meats and, and all these things, they don't, they don't feel guilty about it. They right. actually 
tend to be um, okay. I'm not condoning it or saying that that's, it's the right way to go, but I just think that it's interesting because I've observed it and you can't really deny the fact that your father's older and he's doing well. And some of these men that I know are also older and doing well. I just, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. So there was a book a long time, not, well, I don't know, maybe a decade or so ago called natural cures. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a great book. And, you know, it taught you all the things that you could be doing to better your health. But toward the end, it said, if you're just really attached to something and it makes you feel good, then you just need to do it. If that McDonald's hamburger is the most amazing thing ever, have the McDonald's hamburger, (laughs) you know, because, you know, the way you feel actually kind of overrides everything else. It really does. Yeah. really does. So we have to be in a safe base of accepting and balancing that with, you know, correct knowledge. There's a yoga sutra that I love and it's Heyam Dukam Agatam. That's in Sanskrit. And it means use your wisdom today to prevent future miseries. Hmm. And I love it because it's, it's so true. And wisdom doesn't mean intellect or knowledge per se. It's, it's wisdom right? So it's multidimensional. And we all need to be taking responsibility and empowering ourselves with knowledge, but not to get too wrapped up in the polarized intellect of it, but to tune in to what's, you know, happening in the seasons, in the weather, in our bodies, in the stage of our life, whether you're older, you know, mid, you know, in your midlife or young um, and then what our what our needs are and feeling and tapping into what our needs are and our needs of our tongue are different than the needs of our heart and are, then it's also different than the needs of our body and that's the wisdom that we we all need to, to try to cultivate uh, to learn you know what's right and true for you what resonates but also to balance that with the different needs that that we all have every day that's a very good point that's interesting so I wonder if you could find out what would be the most congruent for your body um, by doing muscle testing. Mm. And I never thought of it having to register on multiple levels. You know, I always thought of it. If you do muscle testing, it's good for your body, but really it has to be good for your mind. You can't feel bad about having it. It's got to be good for your body. And also, I guess, good for your, your, your soul. Was that the third one you had mentioned? Well, there's this Um, taste bud. Like, you know, sometimes you're in the mood for something salty or crunchy or smooth and creamy and sweet. Um, So there's all these different textures and those textures I believe relate to our emotions. Um, Oftentimes when I, or even my clients crave a salty crunchy, it's frustration, sometimes even anger. When we need a touch and comfort, we crave bread and rice and sometimes ice cream. Uh, or cream sauces and pasta. Like, so there's these different textures, I think, that relate to our feelings. Um, and sometimes if we look a little bit, a layer or two underneath, and we take the time to have inquiry and curiosity, uh, it can help to dissolve some of that. And also, if you're in a rush, knowing what your substitutes are. Like, I want something sweet. Maybe I'll have a sweet potato instead of something else or sweet potato fries, or you know, there, there are all these healthier options to get our needs met um, if we simply aren't willing to, or it's inconvenient, it's never really convenient um, <laughs> to dive into inquiry. Um, but your life can depend on it, I, I believe. I believe that if we have the courage to make some changes and, and look deeper within, then we have the possibility of living this, this freedom, living into this freedom that our health provides for us. I can't think of anything that, that is more valuable than our health because without it, nothing can work, right? We can't be fathers and mothers. We can't be uh, productive in our service uh, to, you know, our work. Um, We can't, we just can't be happy, healthy and holy. And so, um, so it's in the intellect, it's the taste buds that are related to the emotions. And then it's the body. The body always knows the answer. That's why kinesiology is so great because your body will tell you. And sometimes well, yeah, that, that's kind of where I was going with that is that. Yeah. So, um, a number of years ago, probably, well, I guess it was 11 years ago, it was a particular weekend. The speaker came in, it was a Tony Robbins event. I speak of Tony Robbins a lot. Nice. Uh, I see a lot of un- weird and unusual things there. And so <laughs> anyway, it comes up in conversation. Yeah. Um, so this gentleman, won all sorts of world records by, I mean, running from the East coast to the West coast. Um, and he would run, I mean, I, I wish I could remember. It was, wow. It, it was just, it was ridiculous what he was doing. Right. 
Um, and I know one time he ran for California and he showed up for the morning show, you know, in New York. Um, <laughs> oh so, but he would, he would you know, just run m- so many hours. So it's such a long distance. And he was explaining to us and it was interesting because he actually, this was kind of back behind the scenes. It wasn't presented to his participants. It was presented to the crew members and he, he was not a fantastic speaker and that's fine. Um, you know, because he was known for his, what his feats, what he was able to do. And he was like, look, I don't put anything in my body unless I muscle test it. The reason I'm able to run from the West coast to the East coast is because I do a muscle test to determine whether this food supplement or whatever it is, is something that my body wants and can use and digest and process properly. And with that, you get the optimal energy level. And with that, in his case, he can run across the United States. Amazing. I love that. And Stu, Stu Middleton, I think is his name. Do you ever find um, that when you muscle test that like, it doesn't always give you a straight answer? Does that ever happen to you? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So there are some variables. You need to be well hydrated and blah, 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 blah. you know, but yes, um, it, 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 it's a little bit of an art, but I find that it's very, um, very accurate when, um, presented properly or when you administer it um, under the right conditions. Absolutely. And I have a friend even who does his muscle testing for everything. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I think that tuning into our body is one of the greatest assets we have. The ability to do that and to access that honesty and that wisdom. Mm-hmm. Because here, I mean, for me, and the mind will lie to me all day long, but the body, the right. body is always true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's a good, if we, if we all learn to muscle test. <laughs> or tune into our bodies. I mean, I'm very yes, interested so yeah. in embodiment practices and it is probably the most effective tool that I've developed for myself and ever. I, I can't, I, I mean, I, I was in a wheelchair for, for many years. And so I know what it's like to be disconnected from my body. And then for many years in my spiritual practice, Uh, one of my coping mechanisms was to kind of be out of my body because it was too intense to be in my body. And Mm. then slowly in the last probably 15, 16 years, I've really worked to integrate um, the wisdom of my body. And it has been more effective than any other methodology because I've been in the coaching world forever. And I know every coaching methodology, I've written coaching methodologies, I've run coaching, coach training companies, I've trained thousands of coaches. So I understand that very well and it's powerful. But I think the embodiment piece is even more powerful. Right. Uh, because we can, that you can move emotion, you can move thought, you can move things through you. And I think that's what energy is. It's, it's emotions are just energy in motion. And you learn how to like titrate your energy through, uh, through your practice, right? Whatever you're thinking and feeling being and eating food also is a, is a form of energy calories are essentially energy, right? Yes. Yes. So I wanted to back up just a little bit and, and I want, I don't want to, um, focus too much on it, but I am curious as to, you said that a lot of Western practices, it they didn't did not work. really work for you well. They didn't. I mean, I had resulting um, bowel issues from all the antibiotics that I was on. I had terrible acne. I mean, my skin was just like cysts all over my skin. It was really, really bad. And so I took every drug they gave me. I took, you know, birth control, um, Accutane, medicine, tetracycline. I mean, everything, injections. Um, I tried everything. And it wasn't until... I was so desperate. And that was to do, what, what were you trying to fix in, the, in those my cases? Acne and my, my acne first, because I was a model at that time in New York City. I was traveling all over the world. And my booker said, Helene, you know, if you, uh, you know, when your skin gets better, we can continue to book you. And I was one of those models that was booked. I mean, months mm-hmm. out. And uh, that was, that was real. I was 18 and I was, I was, I, I was like, what do you mean? You know, she's like, yeah, well, we can't, you, we can't book you until your skin clears up. And so I was desperate. I was in Germany on a shoot and I went to go see a homeopathic doctor for the first time. And he uh, offered me a solution that um, was unusual to me. He said, we need to clean your blood. And I thought, well, like I couldn't wrap my head around it. And then I understood as he planted that seed that your blood can get polluted. 
there can be toxins. He didn't describe that to me, but I just dove in and just and learned about it. And so I learned about the, the natural hygiene, cleansing practices, um, looking at my acne in a much more holistic way uh, as a whole body, you know, my, my blood, my gut. Um, and then I started to really understand the skin and which herbs, you know, so I just really started to look outside Western medicine because the solutions they were providing me were not working. They were not effective for my acne. They were not effective for my irritable bowel syndrome. They were not effective for a number of things that, that were ailing me um, in my you know, early twenties uh, that I had, you know, as a result of all the medication that I had been on, I think that's, that's why I had those problems. And so it's been a slow incremental um, understanding of what what I can do to help myself because I didn't know where else to go. Well, oh. so we spoke a little bit about um, alkaline versus um, acidic uh, foods. Is that kind of the, the philosophy that, you know, when he said clean your blood, was he talking about basically alkalizing the body? I think he was talking about um, the quality of my blood. And I think acid alkaline has something to do with it. It's one part of it, but I think that our toxic load uh, can create more acidity, um, toxic load coming from all the environmental toxins that we all are inundated with through our water system, through animal products, through even organic food. There, there are just a number of toxins coming at us from the paint, the floors, our clothes. <laughs> We're just right. surrounded by, we can't avoid it. I don't I don't care how clean you live. It's, it's in the environment. So we build these things up in our systems and we have to get them out. Acid alkaline though, is an important rule. I believe, I don't want to say rule. It's more of like a ideology. There really isn't a lot of science uh, at this point to back it up, but it's been, a, it, that was a huge pivotal moment for me when I figured that out, when I learned about it and, and led to my, my uh, thesis that I did um, um, for my master's degree nutrition and acid alkaline plays a big role, but so many factors go into it, right? Stress makes one more acidic. Right. Um, of course, high meat, uh, high, high animal product diet makes you acidic. Um, right. Tons of chemicals, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides. So definitely keeping an eye on a more alkaline diet, but really it's about energy. When you think about the foods that are alkaline, they're foods that are filled with phytonutrients, plants. Okay. Plants are alkaline, alkalizing foods. I mean, some, yeah. some, some foods are, are acidic that are plant-based, but, but few, very few. I guess and probably even, more fruits are a little more acidic because they have more sugar. Not, in them. When, not when eaten alone. When they're eaten alone. Oh. Yeah. Like, okay. like tomatoes are only acidic if you eat them with other foods because they ferment and then that becomes acidic. But I when see. you eat tomatoes alone, they're, they're alkaline. And, and like the lemons, what you would think lemons are extremely acidic when they, uh, they process through as ash in the body, I guess, and they become more ac um, alkaline. So they're very, right. they're very alkalizing. Yeah. Those. But, yeah. But on your teeth, they can definitely eat away your enamel. Um, I had to back <laughs> off lemons for a little while. My dentist was like, you really should stop drinking so much lemon. <laughs> I was okay. Like, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> No, but it's true that these are some, some interesting, you know, yes, it's an acidic food, but when ingested, it becomes alkaline. Like spinach is very alkaline, but when cooked can be acidic. So it's just interesting hmm. um, inside. There's so many nuances in acid alkaline. Do you ever that, that book, I alkalize or die? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I still have it. Um, but so it, I did a, uh, an event. It's another Tony Robbins event. <laughs> oh my gosh. He needs to pay me for as much as I plug him. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> so it was a, um, a cleanse. My wife at the time and I went to California, usually held at Fiji, Island, at Fiji, which would have been fantastic, but it was California. It was still amazing, but it was five days of, I mean, basically we didn't need on Sunday. We showed up, we had a salad, uh, Monday, there's no food, Tuesday, no food, Wednesday, no food, Thursday, we had a, had a half a banana. Um, and Friday we were able to, you know, eat, but we really had no desire to eat because, <sighs> You know, throughout the course of the week, we were given lots of like wheatgrass, lots of different types of um, oils that our body needed um, and different drinks, which were very alkalizing. We did a lot of um, lymphocyzing. I guess that's the right word. When you jump up and down on a trampoline and your lymph moves without your, uh, throughout your that's body, it. we did that for hours. Well, maybe not hours on end, but um, no, I would say probably by the end of each day, maybe an hour or so. Um, nice. you know, we did clonics, uh, a couple of clonics. That was an, an experience. Um, 
<laughs> three three times uh, each each of us um and you know i i've had the worst flu-like symptoms that i think i've ever had um during the event because i was going through such a you know stuff was coming out of my nose my yeah. eyes i yeah. was sore um yeah. i just That's felt fun. horrible my my wife wasn't real happy with me she's like we you know come to come to california and you hear you're you're absolutely miserable, you know, trying to jump up and down on this trampoline while, while being, you know, aches and pains. Um, it took me about a week to like reacclimate. I, I really kind of overdid it. I did a lot of the green drink. I did a lot of the oils. I did anything I could do to cleanse my body. So it was kind of a shock to the system. Maybe I would not recommend doing it quite that hardcore. But <laughs> the week for Halloween, um, I absolutely felt felt amazing. I did right. lose. I, I lost some weight, which was, which was good. I, um, yeah. But I had a different energy level that lasted for about three months. Mm -hmm. um, it was fantastic. And yeah. the following, so I had um, debilitating allergies during springtime, oh. but the following, so I guess this took place around Thanksgiving ish. So six months later during springtime, springtime rolls around. I didn't have any allergies, like none at all. And I wasn't on that strict diet anymore. I mean, I was trying to eat better. Mm -hmm. I was aware of what occurred, but what really happened is my system was cleaned out. You know, all that stuff that was kind of deeply embedded in my body, a lot yeah. of that was cleaned out. So my body was able to deal with um, outside stimulus a lot better. It was able to deal with um, pollen a lot better. And I didn't experience any allergies at all. And then mm -hmm. I was like, huh, mm. there's something to this, you know? Yeah. I mean, I knew there was, but that just was like reaffirming months after I did this cleanse. Um, so it, it really, and for my wife, you know, she, uh, um, you know, type one diabetic and wears an insulin pump on her belt. Wow. And for a good long while, uh, until she went back to eating the way she had before, she she didn't really even use the pump. I mean, it's it's like she didn't have that problem. And mm -hmm. there were a number of other things that I won't go into that her body just fell right back in sync and things that she hadn't experienced for years um, started functioning property, properly um, mm -hmm. just because of this weird you know, excursion to California, <laughs> you know, because I love of that story. Yeah. That's so powerful. What a testimonial for the power of nature. Cause it's really just using nature to rebalance your systems because the body wants to heal itself and we just want to procreate and, and come into balance. And the, the, I think a, my opinion about allergies, I had some very severe allergies most of my life, you know, two allergy shots at each arm growing up. I mean, just debilitating allergies. Me too. I had the same. And it wasn't until I did my, you know, really attending to my gut health that my allergies cleared completely. And so oh. I do think there's a very strong correlation and colon hydrotherapy is, is fantastic. I, I definitely use that myself and encourage my clients to also use it. Um, but it, there's a lot that you can do on your own uh, to help to, to, to clear and cleanse the colon um, that I use on a regular basis, including charcoal and marshmallow root and, um, you know, different clays that will, that will really draw out toxins. And we all need to be thinking about this on a regular basis. Colon hydrotherapy, great once, twice, maybe even four times a year, um, or intensively during a cleanse uh, to really facilitate the cleanse. You would have been feeling a lot worse if you hadn't had those three uh, <laughs> colonics. Um, but our, our guts are the basis of our immunity, the basis of our mood, the basis of our health, really. And they're finding out that more and more and more. I hope Western medicine will, will catch up with the education because gastrointernists aren't really well equipped to understand because the, the information is coming out so quickly. Even Stanford University a few years ago said they feel that um, this microbiology, this biology of, of the gut needs to be its own field, its own organ, um, it's just the bacteria and, and, and field of science, because it's so complex how we are these beings of bacteria. It's fascinating. And how and what the balance means and what we need more of. And well, we a lot of these preservatives that are put in the, the, the foods these days, they actually um, they, they kill a lot of that beneficial bacteria. 
in the body. Yes. And that's why we need plants because even the research they do about the fancy expensive probiotics that everyone's buying, they actually don't work as well as just eating a variety of fiber research that came mm. out three months ago, um, informed us that 30 different varieties of plants is what we should be aiming for. So it's not about getting your fiber anymore. It's about the variety of fiber because the fiber from an apple and the fiber from a squash and the fiber from zucchini all serve a different role to proliferate good bacteria in your gut. So we need the different fibers, soluble and insoluble fiber from plants to have a healthy gut biome. It's way more valuable than buying an expensive probiotic, unless of course you can't consume fiber, which some people can't. Their gut is so, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's in a state that isn't accepting fiber, but that's the minority. We really, it, it, it keeps coming back to why plants are so good for us energetically, uh, nutritionally, um, for our health, and also now for our gut and microbiome. It's fascinating. It is. Yeah. So I wanted to hit a little bit on um, light body. Can you tell me a little bit of what that is? So my spiritual name that was given to me um, okay. about 26 years ago um, is Jyoti, which is, which means light. Okay. And we know from a number of religious texts that light comes in like the first sentence, right? Fire or light, you know, light is so important without it, we, life doesn't exist. And so it is the, the, the pillar of our existence. And in our, in our bodies, uh, we channel light through our nervous systems. It is like the electrical system of our body is the nervous system. Okay. So we, we often hear the, the way we use language, right? When we're feeling dark, or cloudy, right? This, the, the mood that that creates. And, and even uh, when you see uh, water stagnant, it's dark and cloudy and then it gets diseases, you know, it smells bad. And so we have this really clear idea of light and dark. Also in every movie and story, the, the tension and polarity and excitement is all around this light and dark, the good and the evil. And uh, I believe that the lifestyle practices that we are all doing, right? Doesn't matter if they're good or bad, right or wrong. We're all practicing things in our lives and whatever we're practicing, we're strengthening. So it could be uh, negative thoughts. It could be positive thoughts, right? So for anyone listening to this and even for ourselves, like what are we doing? What are we practicing throughout our day, all day long? That's cultivating more of it, right? Are we eating healthy foods? Are we eating unhealthy foods? And there are certain foods that I believe uh, bring more light. And if we, is this, it, it could be considered woo woo or metaphysical, but when you look at it as well, it's phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are basically light captured in leaves of plants mm -hmm. and then brought into a form that can be consumed by humans. So it's as if earth was created to prepare itself to receive life from humans and humans then propagate life by consuming plants. And it's been happening for millions and millions and millions of years. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring it up. Of course, you know, you're, you're actually the first nutritionist I've had uh, really on this program. Most of the people that I've had um, also dealing with, uh, you know, health and wellness have more to do with um, the terminology you used was uh, woo woo. <laughs> right. Um, and so when you're dealing with like uh, energetics, for example, you're often talking about um, light or the light body. And um, it's, it's my belief that uh, nutrition and your light body are in many ways directly can, related. They are, they are, because the more light we can consume in our thoughts and our feelings and our actions, including what we do with our bodies, the movement, the vibration, you know, that we're creating through our movements and our thoughts and our feelings, and also the vibrational frequency of the food. So when you weren't eating a lot of food, what were you surviving on water and light? Right. And some people are breatharians, right? That's, that's the extreme. <laughs> yeah. They might disagree with me, but I believe that, uh, and I've seen, you know, my, in my work over these last few decades that people will start eating more plants 
and more light filled food, right? Phytonutrient rich food, which comes from plants, and they will experience a complete transformation in their mind and their bodies and in their spirits. And in order for us to, you know, feel this, feel and, and channel more light, um, we have to open ourselves up to the possibility of that. And it comes from, from these areas, right? What we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're seeing, which is just all we're seeing is a reflection of light. <laughs> And what we're putting in our bodies, right? So denser foods um, tend to transmit less light, right? And dense foods are animal-based foods, um, you know, processed foods. These are denser foods. And they, they slow down the light. They slow down the transmission of light. And so we have to, and no one talks about this, but in my yoga practice, my teacher always talks about the nervous system. And how do we nourish, tonify, and nourish um, our, uh, our nervous systems. And this is something that, you know, it's very challenging for people who are, you know, just trying to make money and just eat, sleep, work, and that's their life. And I, and I get that that's a reality. And we also need more light on the planet right now. And we need to bring more light into our hearts and into our minds and to our bellies. Um, so that we can have more light channeling through us. So we're making better decisions that we're responding in, in more in kinder ways and more loving ways. And it is undeniable this connection between lifestyle practices that bring more light into our hearts, our minds, and our bodies. Love it. Very well said. Yeah. And you definitely lose weight. I mean, I don't know anyone maybe one person, I know a couple of people who are underweight and they struggle to put weight on, but they're definitely not, not the, the majority, but also, I mean, weight has been a big issue for me my whole life. Uh, and bringing more light into your body creates a lighter body. And I know a lot of women are struggling. A lot of men are struggling to keep their weight down and having a light body creates this freedom that we spoke about earlier. And I can't, I just can't imagine anything more powerful. And sometimes I, I, well, not sometimes that's why I do what I do as well is because I sense this, this, this experience in my body of freedom and joy and bliss. And I know it's possible for every human being. And it's just a matter of making some, some adjustments to bring more light into your body through your food and your mind and your feelings. So have you, you had mentioned a little bit ago, um, breatharian, have you met anybody who's a breatharian? Yeah. I've met several breatharians. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I know of one personally. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he'd consider himself a breatharian, but he, um, let's say he's virgin on breatharian. <laughs> so, um, but that, that's very fascinating. So they live off of light. Prana. They live off prana. of prana. Prana, right. Ener the life, energetics, the life force energy of, yeah. And um, yeah, these people are really, and they're, really, they're documented. Like they just don't eat anything. They don't eat anything or wow. drink anything or drink anything. No. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. You know, though, I have to say, you know, how being a yeah, not that that's a, not, not that that's a, a practice that I, I would say that is a good way to go, but I'm kind of curious. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it is curious. It's an that, interesting phenomenon that someone can actually pull that off. I think that, that body chemistry can do it. Living in extremes is, it is amazing they can pull it off, but it's living in extremes is, is one way to live. And I've lived in extremes a lot of my life, you know, fasting or eating, you know, and um, my, my, my hardest practice is finding that moderation. And part of, um, part of the joy of being interested in spirituality and occult sciences is that, you know, when we see the, the, the shaman, he lives, you know, in the Himalayas and he's just breathing and living on air and prana. And it's so beautiful. And I think the greater challenge, though, is living in this day to day life as a parent working in a relationship, like it's actually, I think, much more challenging to achieve those levels of enlightenment as a householder, they say, you know, as a house, as an, as a person just living in this world. And I think it's possible. And I'm here to say that I know it's possible and that I, I believe it's a worthy aim. Well, well, this has been really fantastic. Is there, is there anything else that you'd like to hit on before we start to wrap things up? Oh my gosh. There's so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally open. I'm all yours. 
Yeah, I just want to encourage people, um, myself included, because I encourage myself every day to to take time to breathe, as we were talking about breatharians, because the breath is the most important tool that we have that costs nothing, that goes everywhere with us, and that we have the access to, to breathe. And I think it's really important to note that the nose is in between the head and the heart. And the more we can embody our bodies and, and not live in our heads, which society demands of us in, in a lot of ways, but the more we can breathe through our nose and descend our intellect into our body and spread our intelligence throughout our body and start to start that communion with our body and that innate intelligence, that innate wisdom. I believe that there is a depth of an ocean, like a, a, even beyond the ocean, there's, this, 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 there's so much depth available to us. And simple practices like just taking some deep breaths in the morning to really feel into the energy of the day, to feel into the environment. It's summertime right now. You know, the grapes are starting to ripen on the vine. The peaches are ready for consumption just out my window here. And it's just important for us to, to feel that connection with nature because we're so, you know, in our worlds and our cars and our lives that so just to, to really tune in to what's happening not so much like with our neighbors and with politics, but what's really happening in nature, because that's real. And the more we can get grounded in that, and the more we can eat from the earth, whole foods from the earth, not adultered, right? Not uh, disconnected or, or far away from their natural form. The more we're going to find our connection and harmony with nature and our own body's health. And it's a really simple thing, right? Breathing, connecting to what's true and real in nature, and then also choosing foods that come from nature, that are organically grown, that are in season and ripe, that are close to home, that you can maybe even grow if you have the space and time. And so these simple things, and we talk about you know, light, and we talk about you know, losing weight and attaining health, and it's, it's actually really, really simple but we've got to tune into what's true and real, which is nature, which is our bodies, uh, and which is also light. And we can't always hold on to it, right? Light is like everywhere all the time, but we are responsible for channeling it, clearing our field, clearing our body, and keeping this vehicle open to receive because there isn't actually that much we need when you think about it. <laughs> all this money and things that we want and we do it, we don't really need all of it right it's really really simple so I just want to encourage people to get back to their breath to get back to their bodies to get back to nature <laughs> and find that balance and freedom that's available to all of us and that's that's just one thing like a like a takeaway you know it can be almost too simple but really even on your plate just increase the amount of vegetables you know increase the amount of whole foods in your life and in your children's lives and uh, increase the amount of time that you take with your breath and tuning into your body, even if there's pain there and, and, and learn to accept what's there and, and move with it. <laughs>